I uh, I came up with uh, this iterative view of uh, um, instructional design and uh, developing our uh, open education resources, uh, um, and it's uh, it's a clear adaptation from uh, uh, Ken Beck and his book Extreme Programming Explained, and it's about agile. Uh, uh, software development, and uh, I thought, um, in, in looking at this approach, that uh, it was uh, very appropriate um, to course design. That it was not just limited to uh, an approach uh, uh, for uh, programming. And uh, this extreme programming or agile approach uh, uh, came about because 85% of computer projects fail. And uh, um, what the Agile uh, approach does is it works in short iterations of two weeks. So it's every two weeks you have something that works. And it's like an onion, you build it in a layered approach using modules. And software program today is more about assembling uh, modules than it is about uh, creating uh, uh, computer programs from scratch and uh, in fact uh, I remember about a year ago uh, a speaker from Microsoft was saying that, that they're they're looking at assembling they don't they don't consider themselves to be software creators it's assemblers so they take all kinds of modules and you put them together and uh, um, so I thought this is uh, particularly appropriate for people who are developing OERs you take the OERs from all the different Places, assemble them, and you have a course. Um, but before I really get into that, I'm going to do a very fast preview on mobile learning because the other point I want to make today is that we need to be designing for mobile devices. We should stop designing for print, stop designing from a big PC on your desktop, and start thinking in terms of mobile devices. Because mobile uh, when you design for mobile, you can easily port it to print, you can easily port it on a uh, PC, uh, but the other way around is quite difficult. And the reason I'm pushing that is, right now there's 1.6 billion internet connections in the world out of a population, this Halloween it'll be 7 billion people. Um, there's 3.4 billion mobile devices, 1.3 billion mobile internet users. One third of the world's population, uh, sorry, one third of all the people who access the internet only access it using a mobile device. And uh, here's an example. All over the world, the smallest villages have mobile devices. And if you look at web usage worldwide um, uh, and how they, uh, uh, how they uh, reach the web, um, you can see Asia, it's mobile devices more than anyone uh, else, Africa, uh, in the developing world, and uh, so uh, it's a huge share of uh, total web, re uh, web usage by region. And uh, what you've got to do when you're developing for uh, um, mobile devices is to uh, take a tip from uh, uh, Ken Anderson, and you've got to balance usability, the features, the accessibility, functionality, uh, performance and what bandwidth people have, and you need to have it all in balance to, to, uh, to, to, to ensure that it's workable on a mobile device. So you need fluid design to, and make it flexible. Design it so you don't have horizontal scrolling in particular. And it's easy to do if you just think that way from the beginning. So again, I'm going to say design for mobile first. Now, uh, extreme programming or agile uh, development, uh, uh, it goes uh, from the philosophy of Randy Paz, uh, one good thief is worth 10 scholars. And what it means is uh, there's all kinds of stuff out there that we can use and we don't have to create it ourselves. So what is XP? It's extreme programming, an approach to be adapted for web-based course development. And you take the requirement to design, implementation, verification, and maintenance. And the key to using extreme programming uh, methodology is when the requirements are vague or changing. And uh, uh, 
all the time you find if you're developing a course where um, things change, the subject matter expert, what you're using, the technology, different things change, and you need to be able to adapt to that. So you meet the goals of uh, uh, XP if you use simple design, unit testing, uh, uh, they use pair programming, so they have two programmers working on it, and uh, they, the, the key is the iterative, iterative development. So it's, you build it like the onion. So you always, even after two weeks, you have something that works. And, and that's the key to it. And there's too many, it's sort of the bizarre approach rather than the cathedral. So what, why do 85% of these projects fail? Why do we overrun in our course development uh, costs? Is because we build a huge program and then in the end you find out it doesn't work and you're trying to fix it and debug it. Uh, with an iterative approach, you make sure it works right away. Every little module, every, every tiny part of it. So you, uh, you do a review, testing, design, simplicity. These are all principles of uh, XP architecture and integration. And the key again, we keep saying this, short iterations. So, with the review, you have two people watching it. And that's quite common in, co in course design anyway. You have an SME and uh, uh, an instructional designer. So it's not, nothing uh, that we can't do. Functional testing, when you build a module, you test it right away, make sure that it works. Uh, refactoring is you go back and test it again. And when you build the second module, you go back and test the two of them together. And you pick the simplest possible design. And you go into a major project, you find out uh, what is the minimum requirement for me to succeed in this project, not the big project with all the bells and whistles. What is the minimum requirement that we need in order to complete? And you build that and make sure you have it and do it right away. Do it in two weeks. And then you start adding on the other things. Um, you use uh, metaphor as architecture, so you're building it and uh, um, you use uh, uh, storytelling techniques as part of that. And integration is continuous. So you don't sort of plan at the end you're going to integrate it into something. You, you do it all the time as you're working. And again, I'm going to say it again and again, really, really short iterations. So as you've always got something that works. Um, proven techniques, early concrete feedback between the uh, subject matter expert and the, uh, and the developer, continuous feedback, uh, incremental evolving planning. That is, you don't build the big and say, we're going to build this big thing. You work at it as you go, and you change it as you go. Uh, flexible scheduling, testing all the time, testing to make sure it works, and continuous collaboration. So how is this innovative? All the practices are under one umbrella of uh, extreme programming. Uh, practice as thoroughly as possible. Ensure that the practices support each other to the greatest possible degree. And you have a mentality of sufficiency, not scarcity. And uh, and that's important to realize that uh, um, with infinite bandwidth now and uh, all of this, I mean, we don't have to start thinking, we have to design it and let it fit into one little box. So good practice, you have all of these, the review, architecture, testing, design, short iterations, uh, integration and simplicity, and we sort of always are adjusting, we adjust these things in all different ways. But with XP, you turn everyone up full volume. You really review the architecture, the testing, etc. You have that full, full capacity all the time. Because when you're doing short iterations, you can do that. Um, if you do a big one, then you have to adjust. I'll do the review later. I'll be doing testing later. Um, the design uh, was done up front. And, um, with, a, with, a, with extreme programming, uh, methodologies. We can do that all the time as part of our course design. So, a problem, your schedule slips. The XP solution, 
use short re release cycles. So why would your schedule slip? Is uh, it means you're trying to do too much in too little time. Maybe um, maybe you can do less. A project's cancelled. Solution: the smallest release that makes sense. So as if you're working on a project and and the funding ends, if you've done it iteratively, you'll have something that works. You won't have to throw it away, you, because you've been doing it in short iteration, so every step of the way you have something that works right from the beginning. Problem, the system goes sour and there's too many defects. Continuous testing, you've been testing all the time, so you know it works. Uh, misunderstandings by developers. The content expert is part of the team, so you keep them into it at, at all times. So as, uh, to eliminate any misunderstandings. Uh, the course changes. Shorten the release cycle. So um, uh, XP is perfect for somebody who says, and, and you always get this, the content, that's not just what I wanted. I want, you know, I said that, but I really wanted it this way. And uh, with these type of changes, if you do it in an iterative way using an XP methodology, uh, you can incorporate that in right away without it uh, uh, unduly affecting your, uh, uh, your, your uh, project. Um, big problem, rich in features you don't need. Address only the high priority tasks. So as you've got something that works and then you build something else that you need, something else, the high priorities, and then at the end you'll find out Hey, we've got lots of time to put in the bells and whistles and features um, that may not be needed but are good to have. Staff turnover, people leave. Um, you make people accountable for their own work and we're talking about short iterations so if somebody goes, um, they're accountable up to that point of what they've done and uh, uh, we, can, uh, we can be fairly sure that it's working. Control variables. You've got cost, time, quality, and scope. And you know, we've all discussed the iron triangle. If you decrease the cost, it affects the quality, etc. And uh, um, in a project, um, if you change the cost, if you have too little money or too much, it causes problems. And a lot of people don't realize that, but if you have too much money, it can cause real problems in developing, uh, uh, in, in any type of courseware development. Um, time is a terrible control variable. Um, it's, uh, you can have short-term gains, uh, uh, but, it, but it can be costly. Sorry, um, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, time is a terrible control variable. You want to do short iterations. Uh, if you start stretching the time out, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Quality, uh, short, you get a short-term gain, uh, but it's costly. So if you sacrifice quality, uh, there will be a little gain, but uh, then you're going to get yourself in trouble. The key is the scope. The less scope equals better quality and less time. So you have a project like this, reduce it down to its minimal, uh, uh, minimal of what you need. And then, you've got it built, you have something that works, great. Then add the other things on, build the scope up on after that. So, um, in uh, traditional uh, projects, as they go further and further down, the risk goes up. But uh, with agile projects, the risk leaps down as you go in because you have something behind you that works. You've, been, you've tested it, you've made sure it works, and uh, um, you, uh, you can be pre pretty sure you'll have something that work, works at the end. So uh, the cost of change does not rise over time. So you build these big cathedral projects and uh, change, oh, we can't change now because it's too much into it. But with XP, you can change at any time. Change is cheap using XP. Uh, you can charge ahead, you can defer decisions, you, can, you only need to implement what's needed. 
And quite often, a lot of the dollar costs that you think are going to happen don't happen. You already made it. So the values are there. Uh, simplicity right at the top. Courage, go for it. Uh, feedback, give feedback all the time. Communicate regularly with the, with the uh, people who are accountable. And respect for each other. And uh, the values are all there. Keep it simple, stupid. And uh, um, work on symbol design and design it like an onion. And have it out like that. The Agile Manifesto. Uh, highest priority is early user satisfaction. So get something that works up as soon as you possibly can and test it. Continuous delivery of valuable courseware. Uh, welcome changing requirements, even if it's late in the development. You know, don't panic when the subject matter, well, no, I'd like to do this little bit at the end. You can do that with XP. Uh, Deliver the working courseware frequently. Every two weeks, have something. That's your goal. Every two weeks, you have something that's worth in the testing. The faculty and developers uh, must work together. Um, use motivated developers and faculty. Well, that's in anything. That uh, is always key. Uh, support them. And have uh, face-to-face uh, conversations whenever possible. Uh, working courseware is the measure of progress. So, yak, 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 I've done this, I've done that, and I've heard that from all, all the time. Oh yeah, I've got it, uh, this is it, but it doesn't work. Yeah, I did exactly what you said, but it doesn't work. So, you get working, something that works. Uh, sustainable development, you have continuous attention to excellence. Uh, simplicity, uh, maximize the work that's not done. So pick the work, that kernel of work that needs to be done and maximize the amount that hasn't been done and then slowly you build on it. Uh, Self-organizing teams and uh, regular reflection on effectiveness and adjustment. So the value, uh, um, there's more value in individuals and interactions over uh, the process and the tools you're using. Working software is more valuable than documentation. <coughs> and you see some, some projects, people are very eager to document it. But customer collaboration is more important than negotiating contracts with them. And you see that all the time. Well, the contract said this, and you said that, and I meant this, and I meant that. No, work together. Uh, responding to change rather than following a plan. So you don't have a strict plan that you follow you start responding to the changes as they're needed and come along. So um, that gives you my introduction to it and uh, I'll open it up for comments and uh, questions. And I'm not saying that this is the only way you should do course design, but I think it's a good way. It's one good way you can do it. And I don't think that enough of us are doing it that way. I still see too much of the, the cathedral mentality in course design. Yes, sir. Let me ask you this directly. I mean, you work in an institution um, which I helped create problems in years ago, and uh, you've inherited those. You've got a whole bunch of people that uh, are wedded to that traditional way of doing things with major course teams. Uh, I remember our early courses cost over a million dollars each to produce. Uh, they were produced in beautiful uh, forms so that nobody wanted to been right on them, and they were, they were like PhD theses because faculty were worried about what they would look like in their, for their peers. There's been a lot of evolution since then, but we all know that, that these things get quite embedded in organizations. So what happens when you introduce something like XP, uh, the concept at, at a place like Athabasca? I'm going to turn the answer to that over to Cindy. Oh, that's not um, fair. <laughs> the, uh, uh, we're not there yet, I can no. say that. But Cindy, where are we? We're better than what you're talking about. Yeah. We've come a long way. But... We have come a long way, yeah. and Ross and I talked about this yesterday, but we're not doing agile development like yeah. you're like you're describing at all. I think some of our projects could in fact benefit from something that's close to closer to that. The the problem I have with your methodology is it's not in learning terms. 
And one of the things that we found is beginning to work really successfully in working with professors is that we're talking to them in learning terms. So uh, if we were to use this kind of a methodology, we would have to adapt it further so that we would talk about it, because what we're really talking about now is a learning design approach. And that has resonance. Faculty are really concerned about what students are learning. And they're also, and they're less concerned, of course, at Athabasca about the teaching piece. And I think now, Ross, they're less concerned about their credibility because the university's been around for such a long time. Um, so we need to embed the notion of learning design in an approach that speeds things up. Um, some of the resistance is not among the faculty, though, I need to say. It's in the administrative systems that, that supposedly support um, the design and delivery of courses. And so we need some language that they can also understand. Anyway, it's an interesting idea that they take back and start start working on. But yeah. we're not doing it yet. We yeah, and uh, uh, I must say our, our computer uh, sign, our, our computer uh, services department um, say they're doing it, and they're not. They're not doing it. They're, they're, there's a few people there who are committed to it, and then you find out it's not really being done, um, maybe partially or something, they're not really getting into it. But your point about it, this has to be described in learning terms. I think it can. I think we can. I think this can be very effectively uh, uh, um, put into terms of, you know, you get your module, one module, you get it, don't think of the whole course, go and do it iteratively, change it as it goes along. I, I think we can do that, but you're right, we, and we need to do that. Yes?